All great things must first wear terrifying and monstrous masks in order to inscribe themselves in the hearts of humanity. Okay, so <laughs> that's a little quote to start things off. It comes from a book by Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, and the book is Beyond Good and Evil, and it's in the introduction to Beyond Good and Evil. And uh, it's going to more or less um, be a way of introducing a theme that we're going to take up in much greater detail today, uh, which has to do with the wearing of masks and the role of self-deception in human affairs, especially with regard to what we regard as our moral virtues. Okay, so uh, let's take a minute or two to summarize some of the more salient points from the previous video. This one is going to be uh, the second one in a series where we'll be exploring uh, the works of Friedrich Nietzsche, um, uh, especially with respect to uh, his most famous work, which is not the book entitled Beyond Good and Evil, but rather Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Uh, so, in the last lecture, my wire is getting pulled out. Okay, let's fix this. In the last lecture, uh, we introduced Nietzsche's works uh, by way of the theme of overcoming, which is a theme that appears very early in your reading assignment, which is the first part of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. By the way, um, if you want another uh, sampling of a different kind of writing from Nietzsche, also contained in this great little volume, The Portable Nietzsche, I would highly recommend uh, The Twilight of the Idols, which appears later in the book and is more representative of Nietzsche's more typical style, which is very aphoristic. Uh, stylistically speaking, and you'll find a whole load of aphorisms. In fact, I'm turning to it just now, and it starts off, um, I don't know, uh, maybe with one that is relevant to the project of psychology. So on page uh, 466, idleness is the beginning of all psychology. What? Should psychology be a vice? <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, a little bit mordant <laughs> observation. Many of uh, Nietzsche's observations uh, are a little bit on the mordant side, but um, at any rate, I don't hold that against him, and I don't think you should either. So, uh, some of the main themes from last time. So, uh, overcoming Nietzsche's self-described practice of war, which uh, perhaps in a way makes sense of the mordant quality of a lot of Nietzsche's pronouncements and aphorisms, uh, because he's attempting to draw us, the reader, into the process of our own personal participation in the dynamics of overcoming, and ultimately uh, calling us toward participating in the very large overarching dynamisms of overcoming that might lead humanity beyond itself and into a different way of being altogether, which is denoted by this German term, Ubermensch, or Overman in English. Uh, the thing about uh, the Ubermensch, maybe I should have mentioned this in the last video, is it's hard even to say uh, what this Ubermensch way of being would look like. And the reason why is because from Nietzsche's point of view, uh, we're much closer to, to apes. <laughs> than we are to the Ubermensch. And so it's difficult even to speculate about what this Ubermensch would look like uh, from the point of view of where we are, historically speaking. Um, but at any rate, uh, the idea is that it's much, uh, quite a bit different from how we ourselves are, and that the whole point of humanity is ultimately uh, to overcome itself, in a sense, and carry us toward whatever uh, this uber mensch might be. Uh, sometimes people take uh, Zarathustra as a kind of illustration of what the uber mensch might look like, uh, but uh, personally I find that contention a little bit on the dubious side, and the reason is the one I just gave you, because uh, for Nietzsche, even an illustration uh, like that of Zarathustra is probably uh, much closer to where we are now than where this Ubermensch idea would take us eventually. So the Ubermensch, in contrast to the last man, which is a, a kind of despicable character, uh, who would be the one that would cling as tightly as possible to the last vestiges of humanity, and consequently be the last person possible 
to actually transcend humanity. So it's a, a kind of symbol of our resistance to transcendence, our resistance to overcoming and so on. Then we talked about uh, taking up this project of overcoming in the form of a transvaluation of values. So for Nietzsche, uh, the terrain of subjectivity and more specifically uh, the domain of values is precisely where overcoming might uh, prove more most fruitful and uh, most interesting because uh, the terrain of values has so much to do with how we orient ourselves toward the world, how we construe uh, the meaning of our experience in various ways, what we tend to move toward in life, what we tend to move away from in life, and so on. So uh, he wants to take up this question of values precisely as a function of his desire to write in a way that helps us and helps humanity thereby enter into this overcoming project. And more specifically, he wants to talk about moral values, which is what the, today's video is definitely going to be about. And then we introduced at the end of the last uh, video this term hermeneutic of suspicion. Uh, and once again, a hermeneutic is a systematic way of interpreting something. And a hermeneutic of suspicion is a way of interpreting something that would uh, prompt us to become suspicious of what might otherwise be its uh, unassailable monolithic status. And more specifically, to connect the dots a little bit, um, <laughs> how we tend to regard our own uh, moral way of evaluating ourselves, our actions, our behaviors, ideas in that regard. So he wants to invite us to become suspicious of something that probably we're very invested in not being suspicious of, which is that, uh, you know, what life is about is uh, a definite and more or less hierarchical arrangement of good people, good ideas, good actions, and so on, as opposed to evil ones. Okay, so that's all stuff from last time, which sets us up for today's class, which is going to be about the genealogy of morals. Okay, so uh, maybe to introduce this, let's remember what a genealogy is, or perhaps <laughs> invite you to learn it for the first time. So a genealogy is, uh, you know, a uh, articulation, you know, when people are interested in genealogy, they're interested in their family tree and the history, the lineage, uh, by which they themselves came to be. So if you're interested in genealogy, what you do is, well, I guess in the modern day, you sign on to something like genealogy.com and you can uh, trace out these different forebearers within your family tree and, uh, you know, like notice where they came from and so on. Um, so genealogy is a way of uh, doing a kind of historical rendering is the point, okay? So it's a little bit like genealogy in the normal sense, but uh, for Nietzsche, it's going to be a kind of uh, family tree, as it were, a historical family tree of our moral values and the predominant moral values. So it's definitely going to be very historically oriented. And uh, the main point of historical reference that he's going to be using is to uh, well, the Greeks of antiquity, but the same logic could easily apply to the Romans or even to perhaps a lesser extent uh, the, the medieval period and so on. But he, he localizes it in uh, the morality of the ancient Greeks, and not just the ancient Greeks, but the Homeric Greeks more specifically. Now, here's what you have to remember in terms of a timeline, that the Homeric Greeks were actually relatively older Greeks than the Greeks were used to thinking about, because the Greeks were used to thinking about in the modern academy are people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and uh, I guess those would be the three most famous ones, uh, who lived more or less around the time, well Plato was the middle one and he lived uh, around 400 BC. Okay, so um, Homer <laughs> lived around 800 BC. Okay, so you have to remember that when we're talking about years in the BC range, the numbers go backward. It's like a number line that you learned in elementary school. So Homer is <laughs> living around 800 BC. So that's 400 years before Plato, let's say. So, and in fact, if you study if you study uh, classical Greek, uh, the Greek they typically teach you is uh, the Greek of um, 
uh, Plato and Aristotle, and so in other words, around the period of 400 to 300 BC. So um, uh, the Homeric Greeks are quite a bit older. It's sort of like the difference. In fact, if you study Greek, it's it's that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have an easy time translating Homer. And the reason why is because uh, the difference between uh, the, the Greek of, let's say, Plato and the Greek of Homer is more or less the difference between English today in the early 21st century and English during Shakespeare's time. And if you've read any considerable amount of Shakespeare, you're probably well aware of what a challenge that can be. But at any rate, that's a little bit tangential. Um, uh, okay, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you'll find it interesting. I find ancient languages fascinating. I had a very early fascination with them as a child, and Nietzsche himself was a philologist. Whoa, I thought he was a philosopher. Well, he, uh, we regard him as a philosopher today, but uh, in terms of his uh, vocational aspirations back in the day, in the latter half of the 19th century, he was a philologist. Well, what's a philologist? Well, a philologist is someone who looks at ancient languages and studies them in a lot of detail with an eye toward interpreting ancient texts and revealing different interpretations and alterations in the meaning and so on. So he was very much versed in this thing. I thought I was making a tangent, but actually I'm describing, uh, you know, part of Nietzsche and Nietzsche's, uh, you know, very historical sensibility, which we see borne out once again in this genealogy of morals. So he's looking toward the Homeric Greeks. Now, uh, that's the, those are the Greeks of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and maybe you have to remember a little bit about what you know or what you've seen in movies or wherever, what you've read, uh, about these um, classical Greek heroes like uh, Achilles is probably the most famous one, Agamemnon is probably the next, but there's a whole bunch of others like uh, Hector and um, Ajax and... Uh, you know, Odysseus, of course, which is, who is the hero of uh, not so much the Iliad, but the Odyssey and Menelaus and all these, these, these classical heroic characters of um, Greek antiquity. And the question is, well, you know, what made them heroes? And the answer um, is that they embodied a kind of virtue. And uh, the virtue that they embodied in, in, uh, in Greek, it's known as arete, but um, uh, in English, we usually translate it as either virtue or excellence. Okay, so uh, these classical Homeric heroes were heroes by virtue of possible pun, applause, okay, nothing. I'm getting nothing here. By virtue of their embodying arete or excellence. So the question is, uh, what is excellence as a kind of marker of a moral ordering of the world? Well, uh, excellence for the Homeric Greeks and probably throughout antiquity, all through Roman times, for sure, um, had to do with um, more or less uh, being able to uh, satiate your desires to get what you want in a more or less straightforward way and you had the ability to do that in many different areas of life so unlike today the people we tend to regard as heroes or people who are like maybe really good at basketball or really good at um, uh, you know like Jeff Bezos making money by way of the internet or you know they're sort of like one trick ponies uh, according to today's sort of estimation of what makes someone heroic, but uh, back in antiquity, to be a hero, you had to be good at a whole bunch of different things. And probably the prime example of this might be Odysseus or Ulysses, okay, so same character in antiquity, uh, who, uh, if you read the, um, um, the Odyssey, or if you read the Aeneid in Roman times, you know, like back in the day, you know, when I was a student of Latin, uh, we, we had to translate the Aeneid, so 12 books of the Aeneid, which is a story very similar in a way to um, uh, the story of Odysseus. So Aeneas is wandering around the Mediterranean and having, uh, you know, encounters with a cyclops. And uh, so the question is, what made these kinds of characters heroic? And they, the answer is that they embodied a kind of excellence. In other words, an unblocked will to power, like whatever it is they want, they had the power to achieve it, whether it had to do with leading 
men in battle, or whether it had to do with navigating the open ocean of the Mediterranean, or whether it happened to be uh, interacting with, with gods or mythological creatures, or whether it had to do with things that we might today regard as immoral, like lying. So part of what made these, uh, uh, these uh, heroes of antiquity virtuous was that if they needed to lie, they would be really good at it. If they needed to kill, they would be really good at that too. If they had to trick the gods, they would be good at that too. Okay, so uh, the point you should be getting is that, well, in antiquity, the, the moral ordering of the world in terms of arete basically had to do with having many capabilities and as a consequence of those in, uh, capabilities, having a more or less unblocked will to power where you could get more or less in a fairly direct way, whatever it is you desired. Okay, so you would have desires, and if you were a heroic character, you would be able to fulfill those desires, and you wouldn't feel particularly bad about doing so. Okay, and I'm saying these things in a way where uh, I'm actually foreshadowing sort of the second arc of this analysis. Like, sort of try to com uh, compare this to today, all right, even at this early point in this video. Like, uh, you know, people who more or less do whatever they want because they have an unblocked will to power, they have the capability of getting whatever it is they want, and they don't even have the decency to feel bad about it. Like, how different this moral ordering of the world of antiquity is from what we think is, you know, the obvious uh, moral ordering that we live according to, most of us do, uh, because for the most part, when we see people who do whatever they want, uh, it's really easy to resent those people. And I think that part of, if you, in case you find this sort of strange or unbelievable, it's like, yeah, look at, look at how uh, we tend to treat a lot of celebrities. All right, you know, so a lot of celebrities who, uh, you know, who more or less embody this, this uh, in a sense, uh, this virtue of arete from antiquity. They, they more or less do what they want. It's like Paris Hilton, people like that, or um, like, who is that guy? Charlie Sheen, or uh, maybe the, the, what is her name? Ky Kylie Kardashian, or no, Kylie, she has a different name. Kylie uh, Jenner, is, is that right? I don't know. You guys know this stuff better than I do. But these these characters who, you know, they, it's like, well, I'm a little old school, so I'll use Paris Hilton, um, although she's a little passe right now. But it's like, you know, if she wants to go to bed with a Greek billionaire, she does it, and she doesn't feel bad about it. If she wants to buy her pet dog a $5 million collar when there are people starving in India and China and other parts of the world, she does it and she doesn't feel bad about it. And if you try to make her feel bad about it, she's just not gonna. You know? <laughs> so these, uh, and, and wonder about like how, how we tend to view these people. And usually it's not in a charitable way. It's not in a sort of idolizing way. Okay, so let's, let's sort of, uh, you know, since we're doing a hermeneutic of suspicion, let's, let's, in the spirit of Nietzsche, sort of sow the seeds of a kind of suspicion. It's like, well, isn't that sort of strange that we would be, in a, in a way, sort of uh, resentful and, um, you know, we'd be so quick to put these people down. And, uh, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> maybe there's something going on with us such that that is true. All right, so Nietzsche gives a name to the kind of morality that is kind of straightforward and uh, just about fulfilling your desires like the, the classical heroes of antiquity did. And by the way, it wasn't just sort of the, the heroic characters like Achilles and Agamemnon and people like that. If you think about some of the more dissolute Roman emperors like uh, perhaps uh, Caligula or Nero or uh, I guess if you're into latter Roman history, perhaps uh, Heliogabalus, I don't know who your favorite dissolute Roman emperor happens to be, also known as Elagabalus, by the way, in case you studied a different history book at some point. So um, uh, whichever one, you know, these, these characters too, whom we definitely do not regard uh, as heroic, you know, uh, embodied this kind of master morality. So it's about uh, more or less straightforwardly having your desires and having the capacity to fulfill them. Okay, now, uh, at first this seems like, okay, master morality, that's really about a sort of might makes right moral ordering of the world. Like the stronger you are, 
the better you are. And so uh, this moral ordering of the world, of course, the good would be um, having the capacity to fulfill your desires, and the bad would be being constrained or blocked somehow with respect to uh, trying to fulfill your desires. Okay, so the people who were in that position, uh, of course, in the ancient world were slaves for the most part. Um, but at any rate, um, at first it seems like a might makes right philosophy, but the deeper um, the deeper part of the master morality is people who are in positions of mastery, who have a more or less uh, unimpeded will to power. Like the real use of that is not just to go around oppressing people and making slaves out of people, although that's part of the equation too. Uh, the real um, sort of oomph to that is you have the capacity to generate and create new values and do new modes of perception. All right, so that's the real use of mastery, according to Nietzsche, is the real prerogative of the masters, the one that makes it interesting, is not just being able to order your armies out to uh, Judea or somewhere to subjugate the early Christians or something like that, you know. But the real prerogative is to be, uh, in a sense, the lawgiver with respect to values, okay? Like being able to say what the good is and what it is not, and so on. So, um, in a way, uh, the the center of a master morality is creativity. Okay, at first it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like well, you're just going to be, you know, in one way or another, a despotic type of character. And it's like well, maybe, maybe so. And certainly the the uh, <laughs> the Roman emperors were were pretty good at that. Most of them, anyhow. Uh, if they lived that long, if you read a history of uh, Rome, like a, um, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, you <laughs> the very thing that the, the first thing that might impress you is how what short lives these people had. You know, if you became emperor, uh, there there were like many of them that were like emperor for like a month or something like that before they were uh, poisoned or assassinated. You know, uh, okay, so. Um, Ah, oh, those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> but at any rate, um, the point I'm trying to make at this point is that master morality, the core of the master morality, the thing that really makes it interesting is that it's creative with respect to values. Okay, so you get to create new values. You get to be the one, the ones to do that. So, all right. So let's look at the slaves. So master morality. That's the first thing. Okay. Now let's look at slave morality. So uh, the slaves of antiquity, they also had a morality. Okay, now uh, how did that work? Well, uh, if you have a blocked will to power uh, in one way or another, uh, part of what your morality is going to have to do with is trying to find a way of living through that somehow, trying to find a moral ordering of the world uh, that will make your condition a little bit more bearable. So it has a kind of compensatory function. Your, your moral ordering of the world, it probably does. So, well, how would that work if you're a slave? Like, how could you make your, uh, your condition a little bit more bearable by uh, coming up with a moral ordering of the world uh, that's probably going to be very different from the master's mor moral ordering of the world? And the reason why is because if you're a slave and you buy into the master's moral ordering of the world, well, guess what? That doesn't make your condition any easier. That makes it harder because it makes it obvious, more obvious and more pointed and more cutting that you are in a bad way. You're not in a good way. You don't have an unblocked will to power. You're not <laughs> the, uh, the version of antiquity that would be Paris Hilton today, you know, something like that. You're, you're, you're constrained and constricted in various ways. So um, how can you come up with a moral ordering of the world that would help you get through that in some sense and give you a kind of compensatory value? Well, uh, the way to do it is, uh, if you think about it, is to invert, in a way, in some sense, um, the scales that the masters use so that you end up being in some sense the good guy and the masters end up being the bad guy because a straightforward master morality would code your masters as the good guy and you in a way as the bad guy. Okay, So uh, in one way or another what you're going to try to do is invert that whole thing so that your masters, the people who have an unblocked will to power, end up being the bad guy in some way and you end up being the good guy. 
So the virtue of having a unblocked will to power and an aret arete kind of um, relation to life, it's going to be the opposite of that, all right? Because that's what's going to make your uh, condition quite a bit easier. So the idea that although in this life, perhaps, it's not obvious that you are um, a good guy and consequently will be rewarded as a good person if you're a slave, that's definitely not obvious, okay? But you need to find a way of thinking about things where eventually it will seem like you will become recognized as the good guy, that you will be rewarded. Because right now, if you're a slave in antiquity, is what I mean by right now, it's obvious that you're, you know, Caligula is getting all the, the rewards, right? Like all the things that you might want for yourself. Uh, and you are getting the exact opposite of that. All right, so like how might that work? Well, here's where you have to begin to put on some masks. All right, so here's where the the theme of masks. Let's put on, this isn't a mask, but it's my goofy hat of the day. So uh, you have to put on something that, that makes you look different to yourself. It makes you look different to yourself. Do I look different to you? Okay, so yes, acting like a fool in the service of your greater education. Okay, so um, in other words, the mask, this thing is sort of bothering me like many masks do eventually when you notice them. Ooh, nasty, nasty professor to say something like that. Yeah, when you notice the masks that you're wearing, they can become bothersome when you start to notice it, but it's a trick to notice it. Okay, so Nietzsche's up to this trick in this point in the analysis. So uh, what you have to notice is that maybe what you think of as your virtue is really nothing more than a mask for your deficiency and weakness the thing that, that makes you a slave in the first place, okay? So let's say that again, because this is like a big sort of dramatic moment in this video. Like, uh, it becomes important at some point to notice that your virtue can easily be a mask for your deficiency and weakness. Okay, saying it really slowly so you have time to try to absorb this and wrestle with this. I gave you a bunch of examples in your notes, you know, and uh, these, maybe some of these examples will sort of <laughs> lead you to suspect where this analysis is going to go. So uh, here's the first one I think I noticed in your notes, chastity, you know, like people who think of chastity as their virtue. It's like, well, I've got my sexuality under control and, uh, you know, I'm whatever, not a slave to my glands, and unlike all these other, uh, you know, sort of sybarites out there in the world who are indulging their, their sexual uh, desires, it's like, I've got mine contained, and that makes me virtuous. And it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe at some point that virtue of chastity is nothing more than a mask that disguises the fact that you have a hard time with sexuality somehow, that, you have, that you're inhibited somehow, or you have some kind of weirdness about it, you're not able to let go, or who knows what it is. But that it's a great find, you see, for people who have sexual hang-ups to suddenly discover that they can disguise those sexual hang-ups with a mask of virtue that they can code in terms of something like chastity. Right? Are you getting the trick? It's like what seems to be a virtue on the surface is actually a mask or a disguise for a kind of inhibition or weakness or a kind of blocked or occluded will to power that you might otherwise have. You know, and I think that, uh, you know, like part of what people resent about people like Paris Hilton is, you know, probably in that domain that, you know, they just go to bed with whomever they want and they don't feel bad about it and they, they will cheat or, you know, from our point of view, they cheat, you know, probably from their point of view, they're just getting what they want, you know. Another example, meekness, the meek shall inherit the earth. Okay, that's what we're told. Meekness is a virtue. Um, and the thing is, well, you know, maybe... Uh, that can very easily be a kind of mask that disguises a lack of courage or physical courage or physical ability that what you think of as your meekness is nothing more uh, 
than the mask you hide behind because uh, what's really underneath the mask is that you really don't feel sort of strong enough or capable enough or competent enough somehow, uh, maybe in a very sort of physical way or you don't feel enough sort of courage within yourself uh, to stand. Okay, camera turned off as usual, so that, that to me says get on with at least this part of the video. So I, I thought we were going to do this whole genealogy of morals things in one video. Evidently, that's not going to happen. Okay, so uh, meekness, but I want to go through these examples a little bit because this can be a really counterintuitive thing for, for us, especially in the 21st century who are not denizens of antiquity, but are living in a very different uh, context. So, so meekness, oh, you're like so meek and so mild in all things and you're just such a nice person. Well, maybe, maybe that at some point is really nothing more than a mask for uh, your inability to be courageous enough to disappoint people or anger people or piss people off. Right? So you've decided that, well, you know, since I feel blocked somehow that way, like I'll think of myself as a nice person or a virtuous person, but that really what's going on is a kind of sleight of hand, like a magician, like Ledger Domain or something like that, you know? So, or perhaps prestidigitation. There's a fancy, let's improve your vocabulary. We do this every so often. Prestidigitation. Okay, so that's like a fancy, almost a crazy word. I love crazy words. Um, for magic, okay, prestidigitation, all right. So, um, self-control, here's another one. Like, uh, this one might be, I think this one's fairly common. Well, you know, like people who sort of pride themselves on the virtue of self-control. Well, I'm sort of like controlled in all things and I never let go of control. And, you know, it's like, well, the first irony in that is like your control project can itself be out of control. <laughs> like, uh, you know, but uh, beyond that, you know, well, maybe like all this business of control and self-control is a kind of mask, once again, uh, that disguises your inability to let go of yourself and be out of control, right? Because like at some point you might want to do that. You might want to be out of control every now and then in your life. If you're like, think about it, man, you know, like if you're like having to control yourself, like all the time at every point, like what a, what a hellish prison-like existence that is, like always pacing back and forth behind the iron bars of your control project, you know, never allowing yourself out of the damn cage. It's like, well, you know, maybe that's not the best virtue in life is for you to be self-controlled all the time. Maybe wisdom is sometimes asking you for you to be self-controlled, but maybe sometimes it's asking for you to be out of control. I mean, who says that, that life is always a function of your self-control, <laughs> you know, your personal God project. It's like, well, maybe there's more to life than that. Okay, so frugality. Here's another one I mentioned. And, I'm, and you know, I wanted to mention enough of these so that you get, so that enough of our, what we normally sort of take to be virtues, you start to question them in the spirit of this hermeneutic of suspicion. So frugality, um, well, you, see, you know, I save money all the time and uh, don't overspend and all of this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I never uh, sort of spend on just for self-indulgence. Like, I never buy anything self-indulgent for myself. Um, and, uh, well, you know, once again, that can be a mask, perhaps, for a kind of deficit in yourself. Well, maybe your deficit is that you just have a hard time taking sort of... Uh, sensuous delight in owning things. I mean, there is a kind of pleasure in, uh, you know, buying and owning stuff that you like, you know, and maybe your frugality is just a way of sort of uh, disguising, you know, putting like a, a pretty face, a pretty mask on top of what is really not necessarily a pretty deficit in your life, that you have a hard time sort of indulging, taking sensuous delight in owning things and buying things and so on. All right, so um, hopefully that's enough to, to sort of give you, you see what's common to all these examples, that's the main point, all right? So you see what's common, like every one of them is a way, or at least can be a way, of coding your weakness or your deficit or your blocked will to power as a kind of virtue and thereby inverting what would seem to be the very natural and straightforward way of thinking about what, what is virtuous and desirable in your life, a way of inverting that 
in order to gain a kind of compensatory value in light of the fact that you have various deficiencies and weakness and the compensation is that well you get to think of yourself as high and mighty somehow as the virtual the virtual <laughs> you know maybe it is like virtual there's something virtual and in other words not quite there about it you know so um but I meant to say virtuous, all right? There's something, uh, sort of phony virtue, you know? Like, in this, in this day and age, we have a lot of virtue signaling, in case you haven't noticed, that I think would, would uh, easily fall into this analysis of Nietzsche's. You know, what's virtue signaling about? Well, in case you haven't encountered that term, probably if you're watching this video, you have, because that means you're on the internet, and that's a common uh, turn of phrase on the internet. So virtue signaling is about, you know, sort of... Um, um, putting on a show of our supposed virtue so that we can impress other people with how virtuous we are. Really, of course, we're trying to impress ourselves with our own virtue. And how phony that is, right? 99% of the time, it's like, well, you're trying to impress other people with your virtue. And everyone, everyone knows like how theatrical and phony that is because truly virtuous people don't need to display it. They don't need to go out of their way to convince other people that they're virtuous. Why? Because the value and reality of virtue is already obvious to the people around and to the people that are embodying it. There's no need to say it. There's no need to proclaim it. There's no need to go out in the streets and say, well, I'm a virtuous person somehow. So this would fall under the rubric also of a slave morality kind of thing. Like if you're trying to impress other people with your virtue, you're already wearing a damn mask. You getting it? And a little bit like goofy cowboy hats, you can get tired of them real quickly. Well, maybe not real quickly, but uh, quickly enough. Okay, so the very last idea, because this video is already going on long enough, is the emotional element of a slave morality. Well, there's a bunch of different elements of it, but the main one that Nietzsche talks about is resentment. Okay, so the thing that's really going on in the slave morality inversion of the normal sort of straightforward master morality scale of virtues is a resentment of people whose will to power is relatively unblocked. They more or less do what they want. They don't feel bad about it. They don't feel, uh, you know, pangs of uh, conscience or compunction. They just sort of straightforwardly try to get what they want and they won't feel ashamed of it. They refuse to feel ashamed of it. Well, it's very easy to resent people like that, especially if you've bought into a slave morality yourself. It's like, well, people who, who seem powerful and they, they love their power and they're straightforward, almost like a child in a childlike sort of way. It's easy, very easy to resent people like that. Um, but really what the resentment is about is, um, you know, uh, what we really resent is, in a way, not them, but we resent life for somehow having cast us in the role of slaves in one way or another, okay? And in this day and age, of course, uh, the slavery is mostly within us, right? So it's not so much that we have chattel slavery, although there are occasional pockets of that still in the world, okay, you know, but um, really, the enslavement is, uh, once again, along the terrain of subjectivity and more specifically uh, within the hierarchical arrangement of values that most of us simply take for granted and regard as reality. In other words, our enslavement is at the level of how we perceive reality itself. Okay, have a nice day.